And we should be measuring success in the war on poverty, not based on how much money are we spending, how many programs has government created, and how many people are on those programs. But well, how many people aren't on those programs? Exactly. <laughs> how many people are out of poverty? Are we actually getting at root yes. causes? Are we measuring yes. success by results, not based on effort? Well, hello. Hi, Kay. <laughs> how are you? Good. Thanks for taking the time today to sit down with us and just talk mm. about an issue that I know is vitally important mm. to both of us. I've known you for a long time. And before we get knee deep into a policy discussion about welfare reform or about workforce requirements and all the nitty gritty green eye shade stuff surrounding welfare reform, it was important to me that people know the Paul Ryan that I know. Hmm. I've known you for a long mm, time. You have, we've known each other a long time. And what I know, and what I want others to know is why do you have such a passion for this issue? I, Share. I am so excited about this, this notion of an opportunity society. And as conservatives, we've always believed in equality of opportunity. And I just so believe in the American idea, mm -hmm. the, the condition of your birth does not determine the outcome of your life. In a free society with a free economy and, and, and freedom and limited government, that helps the most people flourish as possible. Mm. And so our conservative principles apply to the problems of the day, give lift to the least among us. And I'm very excited about that. I'm very excited about helping get people out of poverty, into the workforce, helping get people to where they wanna go in life. And that's what our principles are all about. And that's so refreshing to see it actually happening in practice. Right. There's so many policies we've already gotten done that we're really excited about. Um, opportunity zones, um, you know, private sector solutions like social impact bonds. That's all nitty gritty stuff. <laughs> but what, what's exciting about is human flourishing. It's about getting people uh, on the path of life. And it's about creating that, that opportunity society that we've been talking about as conservatives for so long that we now have a really good chance of actually dramatically advancing. Oh, yeah. Not only do we share values, do we share a love of this country, yeah. do we share a desire to see people uplifted out yeah. of poverty, but we share friends as well. As we do. And one of those is Bob Woodson. My mentor. Ab yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that relationship, and I'm particularly interested in what you learned as you travel the country yeah. with him. My original mentor uh, was Jack Kemp. He's, Mine too, yeah, did so you know that? Yeah, so he's who got me into politics. Uh, I mean, I was Jack's staff economics guy working on tax reform <laughs> and the gold standard and all those things. And, I, and, and back then we called them enterprise zones. Yes. But I met Bob Woodson through Jack Kemp in the early 1990s and uh, really took a liking to him in those days. Mm -hmm. I was actually friends with Bob's son, uh, wow. Ron, who, who yes. as you know, passed away in a yes. car accident. Uh, fast forward to 2012, and I was on the ticket with Mitt Romney, and I wanted to talk about this side of conservatism, this side of conservatism that's, that's for lifting the poor up and getting people opportunity and going at root causes of poverty and mm -hmm. focusing on outcomes and results. And so I called up my old friend Bob Woodson, and, and I said, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like you to help me with this. Well, the, he did, but that campaign came and went. Mm -hmm. And after uh, the 2012 election, I called Bob up again, uh, I went back to Congress and said, I want to learn more about the poor, about the struggling of the poor, and about solutions that actually work, and solutions that are homegrown, that are in communities, that aren't, you know, bureaucracy and government in, in, in D.C., but actual poverty solutions, which is exactly what then the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, now called the Woodson Center, was all about. Yeah. So Bob and I, for a couple of years, flew around America. And he took me into um, um, some of the toughest, hardest hit, most poor communities in rural and urban America. I want to focus on that moment yeah. for a minute. Yeah. You cared enough yeah. to get on an airplane, oh, yeah. about once travel a month we did this. Yeah. all over this yeah. country. And so what you're about to propose as policy agendas and initiatives really came out of firsthand experience yeah. And care. Grassroots, uh, going to uh, the poorest communities in America for a couple of years, uh, once a month with Bob, just the, just the two of us. And mm -hmm. sometimes we'd bring um, a staff or two uh, just, to, just to take notes and record things, uh, learning about 
the struggle that people were, were facing, the obstacles they had, but the great solutions. And what Bob, he, he has such a better way with words on these things. <laughs> what he would do is go to poor communities and find people who were beating all of the odds, who were raising good families, who were, who were, who were overcoming incredible struggles. Right. Find out what they were doing, what was their secret to success, figure out what it was and basically broaden it, you know, mm-hmm. put it in a bottle and sell it, meaning mm-hmm. get those ideas and get behind those people. Yeah. There are so many phenomenal people fighting poverty really successfully, turning around uh, uh, people, uh, helping fight bad habits, saving souls. And so that experience taught me mm-hmm. that there's, we're, we're getting it wrong in Washington and we've got to break down the bureaucracy, go with what works. And really it is, it's a manifestation of our, of our conservative principles. As Catholics, we call it subsidiarity, which is do not um, displace local solutions. And we all have an obligation at the local human to human person level to fix these problems. Fight poverty eye to eye, soul to soul, person to person, and find out what works and, and magnify it. And so mm-hmm. that informed me of our, our conservative poverty fighting agenda up here which now we're well into actually making happen, whether it's the opportunity zones that are now in law, social impact bonds that are now in law, or our evidence-based policy commission, which is how to measure success based on outcomes and results, to workforce development and welfare reform, which is where we're going now. Can you tell me from that time that you spent with Bob going around the country, talking to people, learning from people, could you share with uh, us perhaps one interesting person that you met or some lesson that you yeah. learned that, uh, you cha- that changed you uh, or your thinking? I'd say, I'd say that the, 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 the policy, the, the idea of redemption is something mm-hmm. that I really learned and understood uh, more fully. Uh, Anton Lucky is a good example. Anton Lucky was a gang leader in Dallas. He and Omar uh, Jawar. Um, who are two pastors at um, Urban Specialists in inner city uh, South Dallas who have done so much to go get gang members, Crips and Bloods in in, in particular, turn them around and have these gang members, turn them into poverty fighters, turn them into um, people who are revitalizing neighborhoods. And Anton Lucky is a perfect example. He was Mm -hmm. an ambitious young man who scaled the heights of gangs and um, redeemed himself, and now is making sure that people don't go down on that path. Um, Juba Garcia, uh, another a buddy of mine, who runs Outcry in the Barrio. Uh, it started in San Antonio, and, it's, and he's got Outcry in the Barrio Ministries, which are basically taking um, um, heroin-addicted people off the streets, getting them clean, and getting them onto a good life, and they're doing it through Christ. Uh, mm-hmm. Jubal, his dad, Freddy Garcia, started this. Jubal, uh, his dad was a heroin addict himself, and Jubal, his son, has taken this ministry, and it's it's, it's international now. Mm-hmm. There are, there are so many stories just like that yeah. of people who have done so many things. Just in Wisconsin, we've got uh, the Violence Free Zone Schools, which is we're taking and getting mentors with credibility, people who've been through prisons, people who've been in gangs, people who learned the error of their ways and are making sure that younger people don't repeat the mistakes that they made. They have tremendous credibility and they're helping alter the trajectory of people's lives so that they actually um, don't make those mistakes. And they're resetting the system, meaning they're, they're, they're resetting um, young people who are destined for poverty and a life of crime and getting them on a really good path. And it actually works. So mm-hmm. they're going at root causes of poverty, going at um, flooding the zone, so to speak, with good ideas that actually work. And it's, it's person to person, it's, it's eye to eye. I was born to a welfare mom, yeah. a father who was suffering under the chemical addiction of alcohol. Yeah. And my mother had to struggle to raise six children living in a public housing project. And when people ask me you know, about being a black conservative, how in the world can you possibly be Uh, given your particular background. And uh, they tend to think that the policies that I endorse and promote and the comes out of um, of some newfound religion that I got late in life, but quite frankly, uh, my definition incidentally of a black conservative is someone who has the audacity to believe their grandmother. 
Um, <laughs> My grandmother was the best anti-poverty program I ever knew, and the values that she put into us, the things that she instilled in us. And I think because, Mr. Speaker, I have seen the If you're gonna devastating... call me that, I'm calling you Mrs. Ms. James, okay? <laughs> Paul and Kay. All right, that's... we'll go there. Yeah. But I figure, you know, I've got a limited amount of time to throw that title around, so I might as well get it in. Um, you know, it, it, it isn't, in spite of the fact that I came out of those circumstances that I am a conservative and want to yeah. really uh, sink my teeth into some substantive welfare reform, it's because of. Yeah. I lived those programs. I, I have seen the effects yeah. of those programs. Um, and I, I, I was given the honor by George Allen when he was governor of yeah, Virginia right to oversee the reform at that level, at the state level. And to me, it was the highest honor to look at some programs that I had seen over the course of years, the devastating effects. Yeah. And when we as conservatives talk about these issues, mm -hmm. very often people think it's a green eye shade mm -hmm. thing that has to do with uh, balancing budgets and making sure that we bring entitlements under control. But one of the things that I want to walk away from this time, our time together with, is for people to understand and grasp that in your heart of hearts you genuinely care about poor people and you know the effects that our, and this is what how I like to frame the last 50 years of yeah. poverty yeah. policy the unintended consequences right. of the misguided compassion That's right. of people who, who, who genuinely do That's care right. about right. poor people. But I want people to understand you and I genuinely care about poor people and the reason we want to see these policy initiatives and changes is because it will uplift and empower and change their lives and give hope and give opportunity. Yeah, so what I, as a policymaker, I got into this by touring the country with Bob Woodson, finding out about what, what the poor were facing and what their uphill challenges were. Um, and I also walked, looked at what does the government do about this? Obviously, there's a role of, of government mm -hmm. here. No one's suggesting otherwise. Right. But we were coming on the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty. And we were looking at the fact that trillions of dollars had been spent and the poverty rates were stubbornly similar, meaning we really didn't move the needle. So with all this effort, with all these dollars spent, the question was, are we, are, are, have, we, have we won the war on poverty? And the answer was no. No, we no. haven't, not so, by any measure. Not by any measure. So what, that's why we decided like, we gotta rethink this. And we should be measuring success in the war on poverty, not based on how much money are we spending? How many programs is government created? And how many people are on those programs? But well, how many people aren't on those programs? Exactly. How many people are out of poverty? Are we actually getting at root yes. causes? Are we measuring success by results, not based on effort? And so we've been turning um, the ship of state in that direction, pointing it toward there. But what we also learned was, I would say that the, the basic take on this war on poverty was we were telling people in, in America, you are stuck in your current station in life and government is here to help you cope with it, which is antithetical to the American idea of opportunity and upper mobility right. and, and flourishing. And so what we wanted to do was attack that notion and get back into the, the minds of Americans, those who sort of have lost hope, those who have been in multi-generational traps of poverty. This is America, you can make it, you can be who you wanna be, and, and there are ways of doing this. And that, to me, is, is, is that, that mental change on our approach to poverty was really important. And the other thing was, because of this war on poverty, we basically took so many Americans who were not poor and pushed them off to the sidelines and told them, don't worry about it, pay your taxes, government will fix this problem, which is false. Yeah. We need everybody involved. We need people that care. We need them to get involved. We need to do it at their local level. We need to do it with their dollars, with their time, with their, with their instincts, with their ingenuity. And that to me is, is one of the mistakes that was made in this, this war on poverty, which, which, was, which was to displace the kind of human condition, the, 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 the local control, the local institutions, the civil society, which is the space between ourselves and our government that has been sort of atrophying 
because government's been displacing it. We want to revise and revitalize that. And that, to me, is, is one of the benefits of all these reforms and these policies we're pursuing these days. Well, it, it's interesting to me <clears throat> that given all of what's on your plate that this is so important to you. And what I want people to understand as they are listening is that, A, there is a serious problem with the entitlement programs right. in our country. It has devastating effects on the people that we claim exactly to right. care the most about. And that as we get involved in these policy debates and discussions surrounding legislation that we're going to be looking at and involved in, that it's important to understand that you have, I think everybody would concede that, you know, Democrats care a great deal about this, the progressives in this country care to, deeply about poor people, so do we. That's right. So do we. And that's why I think we can and should reach a tremendous amount of consensus that's on right. this, because if you genuinely care about solving the problem of poverty in this country, set the partisanship aside, set the politics aside, and let's look at what works. That's right. And so. That is exactly what, that's the capstone of our agenda for this two year uh, term, which was our Better Way agenda. The capstone of that agenda is attack poverty at root causes, <clears throat> go with what works, education reform, career and technical education reform, prison reform, opportunity zones, social impact bonds, welfare to work, work requirements. Those things actually work to move people from welfare to work so they can get on a path of upper mobility and, and the dignity of work. Can and, we just talk about work for a minute? Yeah. Let's just focus on work. Work works. <laughs> work works. That's Couldn't what have I said keep it telling better. Yeah. Work works. And I think that sometimes people think, you mean-spirited people, why do you want to force people to go to work? Can you just talk about work yeah. for a minute? So first why of all, that's important? Work works because a person gets the dignity of knowing that they themselves are providing for themselves and their family. Yeah. They get pride from it. They learn from it. They grow from it. Their f kids see good examples from it. When my dad died, I was, I was 16 years old. Uh, my mom had to go back to school, got on a bus every day to Madison, Wisconsin, had to go back to school to get a skill so she could start a small business to work. And the, the example that I saw, my mom pursuing an education after you know she and I were at home with, with my Alzheimer's uh, grandmother, wow. Um, that was a great example to me. The work ethic my mom displayed, the courage she displayed, and then to start a small business, uh, just to, to make a life for herself and for us, that to me was so inspiring. I saw that too, and I think it had a profound influence it does. It on does. my life. My mom was on welfare for a short period of time, and she desperately wanted the dignity of work. She wanted to go out and earn the money, and she worked several jobs to get it done. My mom cleaned houses uh, in order yeah. to provide for her family. But not only that, I saw my brothers step up. I saw them go out, the, their love of golf today yeah. has to do with the fact that there was a golf course near our public housing projects and they could go over to the golf course and caddy yeah. and walk around right. all day long and carry those bags. And, and they tell how they would take the money, divide it, and they would put what they would keep in one pocket and what they were gonna bring home to my mom yeah. and the other. I've never seen people who didn't work and who didn't understand that by hard work they could accomplish things. And so we know these examples because oh we've lived word, these examples. Yes. The, point I'm, the point is we want, to sh we want that to be shared with everybody in America. And, and, and by having people work so they can raise, so they can set good examples, so they can get better lives, that is opportunity. Yes, it that is. is dignity. That is the American idea. And so that's the story of America that's a beautiful one that we want to be seen retold and retold and time and again. And the, what's exciting about this moment, this time, is jobs are out there, mm. is the economy is growing. The jobless rate is at a 49-year low. The unemployment rate is at an 18-year low. You know, we, are, we have 6.6 .6 million jobs available right now in America. We have 12 million able-bodied adults who are working age, who could work, who aren't, or could be in school getting a skill who are not. So we have people that we want to pull off of the sidelines 
and get them into work so that they can get on the escalator of life. And that, this is the perfect time to do that because we're not in a deep recession. We don't have massive unemployment. We have opportunities that are out there. So it's the perfect time to help these values and these skills and these lessons be applied to get people out of poverty into you work. Know, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Of course it is. You know, the American people <clears throat> are some of the most compassionate people on the planet. Mm -hmm. We give charitably, we really do. And I think what's important for people to understand as we move into the phase where this becomes uh, legislation and they hear the policy debates going on, that wanting someone to have the opportunity to work, someone who is able to work, yeah. Um, is not a mean-spirited, nasty thing to require of someone. It is one of the most empowering, Absolutely. one of the most uh, exciting opportunities for anyone. I've seen the faces up close and in a personal way of someone who has not had a job first day, mm -hmm. the pride that comes in getting mm -hmm. up and getting dressed and going out to work. And what that means for a kid who actually sees their parent exactly. going out to work and, and the pride that happens when you cash that first paycheck. It's infectious. It really is. And it is this beautiful American idea. And that is what we want to make sure that we pass on to each generation. Well, we've got a lot of work in front of us. But what I'm hoping mm -hmm. is that out of conversations like this, People will come to understand that there are people of goodwill, mm -hmm. people who care about poverty, people who care about uplifting the poor and providing hope and opportunity on both sides Absolutely. of the aisle. And that uh, we want policy that works and has great outcomes because people in poverty deserve just that. This is why I'm hopeful and optimistic. And thank you, Kay, and thank you, Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Ms. <laughs> <Paul>. James. <laughs>